Hello everyone and welcome back to a new video in the introduction to the finite element method and today's video we're going to be talking about chapter 8 development of the linear strain triangle of course we are following in case you're wondering a first course in the finite element method by Daryl and Logan and in case if you are new to the channel then well like share and, and subscribe of course and just notice that this video is part of a video series I will be linking on the top right which talks about the finite element method in general. In today's video, we're going to be talking about the principles of the derivation of the stiffness matrix of the LST element. Later in the next video, we're going to be talking about one example, which is going to be an underwhelming example that we follow from the book, talking about the stiffness of that element. So with that being said, sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Okay, so in today's video, we're going to be talking about the linear strain triangle. LSD stands for this, and as you can see, the strain is linear. What does a linear function mean? Remember, we are talking about 2D space in X and in Y. So a linear function in both directions is, for example, this, where you have a constant and a number multiplied by X and another coefficient multiplied by y. This is what the linear function in both directions means. The linear strain triangle would feature an equation that looks kind of like this. Now following the derivation of course we should assume a displacement function to be able to well find the thing. Now just remember that in the finite element method I am interested in saying force equals stiffness by displacement. Now the displacement is connected to the strain by the derivation partial and the strain is connected to the stress by the material matrix d and the stress is connected to the force so you can see that we need to find the displacement function because i want to partial derive it to the strain multiply my d and then get the force now the book does assume the displacement function magically and explains some pascal triangles i don't want to take the same approach as the book I want to understand this and build the understanding for you step by step. So let's understand. We need the displacement function. We need a u of x and y such that if I partial derive it to x, I get a function that kind of looks like this. And if I partial derive to y, I get a function that kind of looks like this. Of course, the numbers would change, but the function shape is the same. So let's start with partial deriving with respect to x. So the displacement function here should be such that partial deriving gives me this. So let's start with this. Let's assume that this is our strain in x. Let's just assume that. So this has been found by saying partial derivative u with respect to x, and this should be the result. Now I'm using pseudo mathematics here, so for the mathematic geeks here, please take it with a grain of salt. You see, if I want to find u, one direct step is just to, do, to integrate this equation directly with respect to x. So let's do that. If I integrate this with respect to x, well, I get a magical x everywhere, as you can see here, and you can see here. Of course, here the 2 becomes 1 because you divide by 2. Also, you get a constant. That's perfect. So it seems that a good candidate for you is this equation. It seems a good candidate, right? Well, yes and no. Yes, that's a good candidate if you want to, d to derive partially to x. But it doesn't work if you want to partial derive to y, because if you want to partial derive to y, it will not fulfill the linear function criteria. Let's try that. Let's partial derive this to y. If I partial derive to this to y, this is 0 because not y, this is 0 because not y, this is 0 because not y, and the only thing that remains is a5x. Of course, this doesn't have a shape of a linear strain function in both x and y, so this doesn't, fulfill the, uh, this doesn't fulfill our concept. So, yes, it's a good candidate, but it's missing something. You see, if you want it to be a perfect candidate, you would have to add a y component here and a y square component here. So if you partial derive it to y, you get something similar to this. Now, it seems that we have done it haphazardly, and the question here is, well, this worked for our triangle. Do we have to do the same guessing game for other elements, for example, quads? Well, no. 
You see, this guessing game I have done here was only for you to understand how we can assume a displacement function, but in reality, there is a quick tool to deal with this, which is called the Pascal Triangle. I will be talking about this in the last slide of my presentation. So we have our displacement function. Let me remind you, f equals k multiplied by x. I have my x, now I need to find my strain, and then I need to find my stress, and finally I need to find my force by the integration. Of course, here this needs partial derivative, here this needs multiplication by d, and here this needs integration. Of course, I'm still far away because yes, this is the displacement function, but no, I don't know what a1 is, I don't know what a2 is, and so on. I have a displacement function in u and a displacement function, function in v, which means I have 12 unknowns. Which means, once again, I need 12 degrees of freedom, so 6 nodes. You would think, huh, that's strange. I have a triangle, so from the name, tri means 3. So what, do I have a hex angle now? Well, no, those intermediate nodes have been added to fulfill the degrees of freedom of this element. You see, if you want to go a higher order element, you would need more nodes for that. Now, how do I do this? Well, you know the drill in the CST. Of course, I'm linking it now on the top right. What we're going to do is we're going to say, well, let's put the x and y coordinates of number 1. And the displacement should be equal to u1. So, for example, u1 equals a1 plus a2x1 plus a3y1 plus a4x1 square plus a5x1 y1 plus a6 y1 square and so on for u2, u3 and so on. So you see, I have 12 equations like this with 12 unknowns. How can I find that? Well, it's easy for MATLAB. You need to invert this equation. For a human being, this would be a nightmare. You would have to invert this big equation to find the a's in your u equation. Of course, the book goes full on mathematics here and tells you m and whatever, but you get the idea. It doesn't talk about the shape functions, it only mentions that the shape function is m star multiplied by x, where I think m star is this big equation and x is the coordinates. It's kind of strange because the book doesn't use the shape functions in the derivation. Because in the CST, the next natural step was to partially derive the shape function with respect to x as a substitute for the u. This doesn't happen here because what happens actually is he wants to find this train, so he partial derives the u with respect to x and with respect to y. You can see it here. You want to try that? Be my guest. Let's partial derive u to x. This doesn't exist. This is a2. This doesn't exist. This is 2a4. And this becomes a5. Doesn't exist here. So you would have a 0 because a1. You would have 1 multiplied by a2. You would have a 0 here because it doesn't exist. You would have 2 multiplied by x, multiplied by a4, and so on. So yeah, pretty much good. Now once again, you know that the, the strain equals b multiplied by the displacement. And it tells you b is actually m dash multiplied by x, because the m is what contains your x and y components. You can see that this is actually a derivative of the shape functions, albeit in a different way. By deriving m, you're deriving the shape functions. Strange, but it works, I guess. Notice that for one single triangle, the effort as a human being to calculate by hand is exponential. The reason why we are doing this is to prepare you for the isoparametric formulation so that you can see that, well, at least the isoparametric formulation with its, with its complications is much easier than going down this rabbit hole. Of course, the final step here is to take your strain, multiply by the material matrix to get your stresses, and integrate to get your stiffness matrix. Those are the steps of the CST. Nothing to add here. Before I finish, I wanted to tell you something about the Pascal Triangle. If you want a polynomial constant, then you take only a1. If you want a linear polynomial, you take a1 plus a2x plus a3y. You can see a triangle forming. If you want a quadratic or a degree 2 Pascal polynomial, then you would take this triangle, which is a1 plus a2x plus a3y plus a4x squared plus a5xy plus a6 y square. If you want to cube it, you would take the full triangle here. You could even go one step further if you want. You would take the full triangle and say a1 plus a2x plus a3y plus a4x square 
plus A5XY plus A6Y square, A7X cube, A8X square Y, A9XY square, and A10Y cube. Of course, if you have a keen eye, you might get confused because you would think, wait a minute, this linear function was used in the constant strain triangle. It doesn't make sense, apparently, because this has a constant strain triangle, yet you are using a linear here. So what gives? Well, it's perfectly fine and perfectly logical because the triangle here in chapter six was called the constant strain triangle. The linear here is for the displacement function. And as you know, the strain is the partial derivative of the displacement function. So if your displacement function is linear, your strain is constant. So this checks out. You would also say, wait a minute, I have a linear strain triangle. Why am I using quadratic equations? Same reason, because this is the displacement function. And if you partial derive it, you get a linear strain function. So this checks out too. So yeah, that's everything I wanted to talk about in my theory video today. I hope that you enjoyed it. And before I finish, I want to give a Pascal triangle sized shout out to our dear channel members in the contributor level and the helper level whose names are going to be shown on the screen. I want to thank them from the bottom of my heart as the support of the channel is priceless to me and enables me to provide you with the videos on time, hopefully, and with a certain quality I try to achieve. And for that, I am forever thankful. Of course, I hope that you enjoyed the video and it was beneficial for you. Of course, if you have enjoyed the video, then consider providing a sacrifice to the YouTube algorithm by liking, sharing, subscribing, and so on. Especially subscribing because it helps increase the reach of my channel. With that being said, and as per usual, this is the Civil Engineering Essentials channel and we'll catch you in the next video. Bye-bye.